Hey guys, in today's video we're going to be talking about COE computation, basically taking an R a position vector and a V velocity vector and being able from those two bits of information being able to calculate all six of our classical orbital elements. By the end you should know what the E vector and the N vector represent. You should also know which vectors each COE is the angle between. So we're going to actually just use an example and kind of work through this example in detail for this video. And by the end of it, you should have enough principles together that you could use this to solve other problems. So this is the kind of information that you might be given on a GR. We might give you an R vector that's equal to, in this case, negative 7,000 J hat kilometers. This is in the IJK frame. Here, the I and the K components are zero, so they're just left off. So we just tell you that it's equal to negative 7,000 J. Then we give you a velocity vector of 7.5 K kilometers per second. We might ask you to find these six orbital elements. And the first step would be, how do I find A? How do I find my semi-major axis? So we, with this, we look at our specific mechanical energy. And if you recall, our specific mechanical energy is equal to our V squared over 2 minus mu over r. And this is going to be constant for our orbit. So our specific mechanical energy, if we know it at one place, we know it at every place. So we're going to be able to use this expression to solve for our semi-major axis. So that's what we're going to do. Um, if you remember that the r vector, when we just write it without a vector or symbol over the top of it, we're asking, actually asking you for the magnitude. Here, this would be r is equal to um, the r vector, the absolute value of that. Since it only has one component, it's just simply that 6, 7,000. If it wasn't one component, you would take the, the sum of the squares and take that entire thing and square root it, um, as you've done on the FSC. So that should look familiar. The V vector, we can find its magnitude at 7.5 kilometers per second. We plug those two values in, 7.5 and 7,000, to our expression for specific mechanical energy, and we get negative 28.82 kilometers squared per second squared. Excellent. We can relate that to another expression we have for our specific mechanical energy, that of negative mu over 2a. Rearrange algebraically to solve for a, and we can find that our a is equal to 6916 kilometers. So we've got one done, five to go. So let's look at E. And with this step, we're actually going to show you, I'm going to show you that you can find a, a little bonus. You get new in there as well. So we're going to look at a relationship between our two vectors. If you recall from the FSC, when you dot two vectors together, you're really looking at the projection. So this is the projection of those two vectors. And if two vectors have a projection of zero, it means that by definition, they must be um, perpendicular to one another. So we're going to find here when we take the dot product of these two vectors, our 7,000, negative 7,000 J and 7.5 K, that we get a scalar of zero. When we do that, we know, again, our R and V vectors must be perpendicular. And that only happens on an elliptical orbit at two very special positions, either apogee or perigee, or it turns out that it's going to happen everywhere on a circle. So how do I know which one? This is describing my, so the R vector is describing my current position. So am I at apogee, perigee, or am I on a circle? How do I know? I'm going to draw a picture here to kind of illustrate how we would know where we were at. So to begin with, we have a, an elliptical orbit. Our Earth is at one foci, and we could draw our semi-major axis as half of our major axis. And we, if we were at apogee, we, have, we would have a current position, or an R, that would be much larger. This purple vector is much larger than our, than our red A here. So that would be a situation where we're at apogee. If our R position, or this yellow vector, um, is smaller than the A vector, we would have to be at perigee. And if R was equal to A, then we would be on a circle. So if R dot V equals zero, then we can go to these expressions where R is greater than A, then we're at apogee, perigee, or circle. Okay, so let's look at our situation here. Specifically, we are at a current position of 7,000 kilometers away from the Earth that's going to be larger than our semi-major axis that we calculated from step one of 6,916 kilometers. So therefore, we must be at apogee. If we are at apogee, then our true anomaly must be 180 degrees by definition. So bonus, great. So how do we go about solving for our eccentricity? So to solve for eccentricity, we use whatever relationship we have with our current position. So we're going to use this expression for RA is equal to A minus 1, 1 minus E. And we're going to use RA because we're at apogee. We re rearrange algebraically, and we can solve for E. And we find in this particular case that our E is equal to 0 0.0122. All right, three down, three to go. Let's find our right ascension descending node, or RAN. So to begin with, we're going to actually sketch a picture of this. So sketch, we're going to sketch something in a 3D uh, coordinate frame, so our IJK geocentric coordinate system. 
this is what this would look like. I also sketched here a kind of the plane of the orbit. So that kind of helps me visualize that this IJ lie in this equatorial plane. So this is kind of like the tabletop, if you will, of the orbit. All right, so to sketch the R vector, we're going to move negative 7,000 J. So I'm going to move in the negative J direction, and I'm going to draw my R vector. And then I'm going to draw my V vector at the end of my R vector. That's how I like to do it. I'm going to draw the V vector here, starting at the end of where my spacecraft current position is. And I'm going to move in the positive K direction. So that's why my vector goes straight up out of this plane here. So that's my R and V vector. Now I'm going to find the ascending node. And if you remember, the ascending node is going to be the point the line of nodes are going to be the intersection uh, points between our orbital plane and our equatorial plane. So our ascending node is going to be right here at this point because that's where our orbital plane is going to intersect our equatorial plane. And you might say, well, you know, if this is an orbit, I'm going to be going around in a circle somehow or an ellipse, then at some point I'm going to intersect over here. So how do I know this is the ascending node? So for that, I look at my direction of my velocity, and my velocity is going from in this direction. So my spacecraft, if I'm moving on a, on a elliptical orbit, is going to be moving kind of something like this. And so I'm going to be moving from south to north. So this is my ascending node by definition. Therefore, my descending node must be 180 degrees away from that. So I'm going to put that over here as like as an X. And remember that the N or our nodal vector points to the ascending node. So I'm going to sketch that N vector here from the center of the Earth all the way out to my ascending node. So this is my N vector. And lastly, I remember that my RAN is between I and N. So that's going to be the vector in, uh, measured eastward. So from I to N in the equatorial plane. That might look something like this. If this is my angle here, I've moved 180 degrees to get back around to the negative I axis and then another 90 degrees to get around to the negative J. So therefore, my RAN, my right ascent to the ascending node, must be 270 degrees. So there it is. So two more. Let's find our I, our inclination. So for this, I'm going to use the right-hand rule to find my specific angular momentum, and that's going to be R cross V. So to do that, I'm not going to actually conduct the cross product like you might have done on the FSC. I'm just going to use the right-hand rule. So right-hand rule, I'm going to put my fingers along the R vector. I'm going to I'm going to curve my hand along the V vector, and my thumb now is going to point in the direction of the specific angular momentum vector. So fingers here, or well, hand here, I guess, and then fingers along V. And so now I've got my H vector in this direction. And I is going to be the angle between K and H. Well, it's not apparent to me that there's an angle between K and H or what that is. So one property of vectors is that you can actually shift them in 3D space. And so that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to sketch my K vector over here along, you know, essentially where my spacecraft is at. And then from this picture, it's clear to me that the inclination of this particular orbit must be 90 degrees. So I'm actually in a polar orbit. So lo and behold. So polar orbit, one more uh, orbital element to go, and that is my argument of perigee. So how do I find that? So to begin with, I find the perigee of the orbit. So if you remember from the earlier steps, I found that I was at apogee. If I'm at apogee, then perigee must be 180 degrees away from me. So perigee must be right over here at the descending node. E points to perigee. So here I can sketch my E vector, my eccentricity vector. Remember, the magnitude of the eccentricity vector is actually the E value itself. So here's what my eccentricity vector would look like. It's pointing towards perigee. I'm going to sketch the orbit with this because now I have enough information to sketch the orbit. So I'm going to start here, and I'm going to draw over to our essentially perigee point, and then I'm going to go back around. And so you can kind of start to imagine what this, what this orbit would look like. And then lastly, I remember that the argument of perigee is the angle between N and E. And if you forget that, look on your equation sheet because that's where it is. It'll show you. It's the vector or the angle between N and E. So what's the angle between N and E? Well, it's clear in this case that it's 180 degrees, and that's exactly what it is. So I've got all of my orbital elements now. A is equal to 6,916. E is equal to 0 0.0122. I was equal to 90. Right ascension of the sending node was equal to 270. Our argument of perigee was 180, and our true anomaly was 180. So that's how you kind of walk through those problems. We're going to work through more of these problems in class. I hope that this was helpful, and we'll see you in class very soon. Thanks. And hey, guys, again, it's uh, me, Major Cunningham from the Astro Department. Uh, I've got a tutorial video here. <clears throat> We're going to do an example problem of R cross V to COEs. Oops. Let me scooch that back. This is exactly like you're going to see it on a GR, and it's exactly like you saw it on, it's similar to what you saw on the homework too, but 
This is from an old GR that we've released for your guys' you know, practicing pleasure. And, of course, I've got my trusty calculator here. Uh, remembering that you can bring whatever calculator you please to our GRs. Uh, it just has to be cleared of memory. You can't program in extra code. But if you're more comfortable, like I am, with you know your TI whatever huge number that you've had since high school uh, versus the honor later, that is totally okay with us. So uh, just a heads up there. Okay, well, let's begin. This is one of the, I, I would say this is probably one of the most complex parts of the whole Astro course. Uh, if not the toughest problem. And the, the funny thing is it, it defeats people because it looks intimidating, but it's actually not. It's about eight tiny steps. And I think, I know, I know everyone can do eight tiny steps. So let's, let's do that. So what I'm going to show you first is the long way. And, and I say the long way because there are a couple of tricks I'll show you in a little bit that can make things go a little faster. Uh, but not much, and if you do it the quote-unquote long way or the, I don't know what the best word to call it is, my my way basically will always work every time, and if you practice a couple of these problems and get a little fast with it, you can move through these really quickly. So let's let's do it the long way first, and then I'll show you where you can kind of cut a couple of corners. Okay. Yeah, and of course the next thing I'm going to grab is my equation sheet. This is going to be you know, included for you on the GR. So tell you what, let me go like this. Set it up like that, and we should be good to go. Okay, so we'll begin with semi-major axis. And literally what you do is you walk your way down from top to the bottom and give yourself all the six COEs. There's a couple initial steps, and I would say that's the toughest part to remember because the rest of this problem literally is just you going down this area of the equation sheet right here, just walking your way through it. You'll find that it actually goes pretty, pretty fast, I promise. So watch. Okay, first step. I want to take the magnitude of my R vector. You guys remember how to do this. If not, I'm about to show you. And you could actually do this without even plugging it into the calculator. That's just going to come out to be 14,000 kilometers. Remember your units. That's always a good thing. Let's do the same thing for that V vector. I'll go ahead and just write it correctly here or try. Let me get rid of that I. 3 squared plus 0 squared plus 3 squared. And that's going to be the square root of 18. And I do not know that off the top of my head. I'm going to mash that into the old calculator. 4.243. Okay, great. We're going to need this for later. That's why we do it right, right now. <clears throat> okay. Next thing's next. Let's use what we just found to find some major axis. Okay. The way we're going to do this is we're going to harness this tool, Epsilon. If you guys remember, Epsilon is actually not in this part of the equation sheet. It's actually, oh, it's from the previous part that we talked about. Epsilon is specific mechanical energy. And your equation sheet tells you it's equal to like three different things, right? We're going to use this part and this part. So watch this. If Epsilon is equal to negative mu over 2a. And it also equals v squared over 2 minus mu over r. I'll tell you what, why don't we just set those equal to each other? Now, I recommend, I highly recommend solving algebraically first. And what do I mean by that? Well, I'm going to multiply both sides by uh, 2a divided by 2. I'll show you what I mean here. Probably better to write it rather than explain it. But what I'm looking for is a. So I'll multiply both sides by a. Of course, that'll cancel my A out over there. I'm going to multiply both sides by 2. Actually, let me do it this way. I'm going to divide both, both sides of the equation by V squared over 2 minus mu over R. That's why I didn't. 
write it out. It's a little bit long. So when we solve algebraically, this is what we get. If you're not comfortable with doing this, come see me, okay? You gotta be comfortable solving algebraically because if you start plugging numbers in, you run the risk of a lot of errors. So why don't we now begin to plug some numbers in? Cool, we know that. 2 times v squared over 2. So v we found up here was a 4.24. So I square that back again to get 18. Over uh -oh. r, which I found to be 14,000 earlier. Okay, good. So let's mash. I get 10,235.5 kilometers. I happen to know that is indeed correct. And of course, we always want to circle or box our answers in Astro 310. That helps the instructors who are grading give us grades. Okay, I'm going to put this up here for now. If you encounter a situation on the GR where you need more space, ask us for an extra piece of paper. We will help you out, and then we'll attach that to, to your GR at the end. In particular, folks need more room for this problem. And for the sake of doing this problem here uh, on the webcam, I'm going to go ahead and just try and write as clearly as I can, much bigger than I normally would. So, okay, we found A. Let's find E. Well, now I get to just start marching down the equation sheet. Going to use the eccentricity vector to find E. So that's our goal here. All right, let me write out the equation. It's a little bit of a beast, but what you're going to find is it goes really quickly. I'll quit saying that. You can just believe me. Try it and believe me. Ooh, doggies. That's a tough one. Okay, first of all, R dotted with V. This is something that, I don't know, personal preference, but you may want to do R dotted with V right off the bat. But I'm going to do that just kind of as a matter of course here. When I do a dot product, I always write the two vectors, one on top of the other, so I can easily see everything. So that's what I'm going to do here. Oh, if I actually do it. I'm going to multiply 0 by 3 to get 0. <laughs> Negative 14,000 by 0 to get 0 and 0 times 3 to get 0. Add them all up, obviously you get 0. This is important because there's only a couple places in the world ever, if I had an orbit like this, let me just kind of give you an example. You guys will remember that from the center of the Earth out to where a satellite is, that's our R vector. And our V vector is tangential. But as your satellite gets farther away, for example, from the Earth, the relative position of the vectors to each other changes until you get, oh boy, uh, assume this is apogee. <laughs> you get to the point where your V vector and your R vector are perpendicular, and that means that they are parallel. Or sorry, uh, perpendicular. <laughs> That means the r dotted with v is going to equal zero because the dot product is a shadow, if you guys remember, of one vector on another. That's just what a dot product is. Okay, so why do I care? Well, wherever r dot v is zero, I'm either at perigee, because you can imagine r vector here, v vector going like this, big v vector, right, because it's at perigee. But they're perpendicular here, they're perpendicular here, and they're also perpendicular everywhere on a circular orbit. So, if you were to see a question that asked you, hey, just quick, tell me if I'm in an apogee perigee or circular orbit, you could just take r dot v 
And if it's zero, things really start to fall away quickly. It turns out, in this case, it is. So what does that mean? Well, it means that this nasty term, because r dotted with v is zero, zero times this v vector goes to zero. So what we're left with is the eccentricity vector being this kind of mess. which this is going to be a scalar, right? No direction. We're going to multiply that by the R vector that we were given. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so let's go ahead and, and plug in some numbers. So what is that going to look like? Well, it's going to be as shown. Let's see, V from previous was... 4.243 squared minus. Over R, which I found was 14,000. We're going to multiply whatever this big thing is. It's actually going to turn out to be a very small number. Times the R vector, which was 0i minus 14,000j plus 0k. Okay. I like to work this whole area out first. It seems to help a lot. So, cool. give us this giant or actually small number that we can multiply by our r vector so let's see i get it to be this negative 2.626 number so let's see let me write it out 2626 times 10 negative fifth times the r vector Right, and we'll multiply this scalar by each of these terms. Whew, and what that gives us finally is that the eccentricity vector is equal to zero i plus let's see. Zero point three six eight hat plus zero k hat. Now that's great, but that's not what the problem asked for. It wanted eccentricity, period, right? So what that really is, is the magnitude of the eccentricity vector. All right, and that's just going to give us 0.368. Box it. Crush it. Keep moving. We've got A and E, and things really start to move quickly from here. I'm going to keep those by my side. Okay, next thing. We want to find inclination. Notice how I am just walking myself now down this side of the equation sheet. Okay, so step three, inclination. Inclination is the tilt of the orbit off the equatorial plane, if you guys remember. Equation for it is this. Okay, and you might say, well, what's H? We have not found that yet. Well, conveniently, <laughs> H is located right here. H is the cross product of the R vector and the V vector. Well, let's do a cross product. This is good review. Here's how I do it. I set up my, my matrix. And then I plug numbers from, <clears throat> let me grab this real quick. R vector was 0, negative 14,000, and 0, 
3, 0, and 3. Okay, cool. So the first thing that I do is, actually, let me try and write this out a little better. I do it like this. I write kind of a, I just stack the terms on top of each other. So otherwise it takes up like a full line of your page and that's, that's a pain. Okay. So first I want to find what my I hat components are. I'm going to go negative 14,000 times three, kind of like this, right? That's why it's called a cross, but let me delete that for now. So you take your upper left times your bottom right, plug those in, and then you subtract your bottom left times your top right, which in this case is nice and simple, all zeros. Okay, notice how my finger is covering up, and maybe I should use a different finger, but this is just more convenient. I'm not trying to flip you off. I'm covering up I. Now, I want to find J, so I cover up J. Now, I'm going to try and go over my finger, right? 0 times 3 minus 3 times 0. Cool, almost there. Now, we're going to do 0 times 0 minus 3 times negative 14,000. So. Right on. Okay, so let's see what that comes out to. I'm just going to plug it back in over here. So this turns out to be, what's 3 times 14,000? I should know that, but I don't. 42,000. Okay, and it's a negative 42,000. I can see. I hat. And that's going to be subtracted. We're always going to remember our negative sign out in front of the J term. It's just how cross products are. It's how we do them. But that's zero, so that's convenient, right? The J term plus the K term, which is zero times zero minus a minus negative 14,000 times three. So that ends up being 42,000 K hat. That's that, spe uh, not specific, that's the angular momentum vector. That's what H is, is in plain English. That's what it is. If you guys remember <clears throat> an orbit going around, let's say it, it's going like this. Here's Earth. Satellite going around like this. If you were to orient your fingers in the direction of the orbit, like that, your thumb completes the right-hand rule, and it's coming up out of the page. H vector. Can you touch H vector? I, I mean, it's it's kind of an ethereal concept. Can't reach out and and hold an H vector in your hand. It's it's a mathematical result of uh, a three-axis coordinate system. So, we're finding it on the way to getting inclination. Now. Let's write up here, just to remind ourselves, what is the unit vector k hat? If I were to write it out in its fullest, most joyful form, it would look like this. Right, no i hat, no j hat, just k hat. So that's gonna help us because we're gonna take that and dot it with the h that we just found. That is pretty neat. So what I'm gonna do is write, K hat, as I do. On top of H vector. And try not to run out of space. We'll go multiply, multiply, multiply. So K at data with h equals zero plus zero plus forty two thousand. So that's forty two thousand. <laughs> now we needed that because we're going to plug that into our cosine equation. The last thing we need is to find the bottom. So all, all of this that I've written so far was to satisfy the top term. The bottom term is going to fall out pretty quickly. What happens when we take the magnitude of a unit vector? 0 squared plus 0 squared plus 1 squared, obviously just 1. H vector is a little more complicated, but not much. Oh, there we go.
may seem like an insanely big number. Again, this is one of those mathematical properties we're just going to use in order to get inclination. So it's that. Let's see. Nine, seven. Cool. Now let's plug and chug. So to find inclination, I got to take the inverse cosine of that equation on the equation sheet. So if I do that to both sides, K dotted with H. Well, what do we find that? That was 42,000. Great. What's the magnitude of K, which is 1, oops, times the magnitude of H vector, which is that? Well, Now, quick note, when you're doing these problems, R cross V to COE, I don't know what your computer looks like, your computer, your calculator. Mine has a little mode where I can switch it from radian to degrees. I want to do that. I want to make sure I put it in degrees for this because that's just how the business talks about the COEs. It's in kilometers and degrees. And, of course, eccentricity, which has no units. Okay, so let's plug and also chug. Boom, 45 degrees. Box it. Let's keep pressing. All right. I'll probably need some of these later, but let's go back to the equation sheet. Okay. Next stop, ran. You guys will remember is the distance angularly, so the number of degrees between i hat, which is fixed in space, around the equator to where the ascending node is for a particular orbit. Math wise, what is it? Well, let's check it out. Math wise, it's another majestic cosine equation. Cosine of ran is i hat dotted with n vector over magnitude of i vector of i hat magnitude of n hat you noticing a pattern here all right well let's do let's begin first things first i hat another one of these very easy unit vectors right one i hat plus zero j hat plus zero k hat bring my paper down a little bit the tricky thing or not so tricky but we need to find n vector. We have not done that yet. The nodal vector, n vector, points out from the center of the Earth to the ascending node. So this is an important vector. On your equation sheet, it says that, oh, let me scooch this over here a little bit. n vector is k hat crossed with h vector. So k hat crossed with h vector. Now remember, k hat is 0i plus 0j plus 1k. H vector from previous, yeah, I knew we were going to need it again, was negative 42,000i hat no, 0j hat was 42,000 k hat. All right, so since we have a cross product, let's set that up. I, J, K. I just kidding. I, J, K. I, J, K, right? That's how I would text it to somebody. <laughs> okay, let's set it up. Zero, zero, one. Set it up and knock it down. 42,000, zero. 42,000. And I'll write out my matrix over here like I do. Okay, covering up I. Bonk. Zero times 42,000. Minus zero times one. That's nice. Zero times 42,000. Minus a minus 42,000. Oh boy, we're running out of space. 
Yeah, I'll put a minus sign there. Okay, <laughs> zero times zero, minus a minus 42,000 times zero. I see a lot of zeros up in here. I really do. So, bring it over here. N vector equals zero I. Let's see. Oh, almost forgot myself. Never forget your negative sign in front of your J term. So minus a minus of a minus. So it's still minus negative 42,000 J hat. And then, of course, plus zero K hat. So that's great. All right. So now what if I dot N, if I dot N with I? So let me go ahead and write out I hat. Oop. Let me write it out correctly. How about one I hat plus zero J hat plus zero K hat. And vector zero I hat minus 42,000 J hat plus zero K hat. Boom, boom, boom. I get zero, zero, and zero. So what does that mean? Well, it means that I dotted with N is zero. Oops, let me make that look like an actual N. A lot better. Cool. So I dotted with N is zero. That means the top term here is going to be zero. All right. Let's address the bottom term. Magnitude of I is going to be the square root of 1 squared plus 0 squared plus 0 squared, which is 1. You guys can just remember this. This is a way to speed it up. The magnitude of a unit vector is always 1. Always going to be one. You can take that to the bank. Okay. In hat magnitude, also pretty straightforward. You guys are probably beating me to it already. But what I see is that's just going to be 42,000. Now, you might ask, well, what does it matter if I know I have a zero on my top term here and my denominator who cares? It's going to be cosine of zero. Just working it out so you could see, just in case the top term was not zero. So along those lines, let's finish this out. Ran equals cosine, inverse cosine rather. Uh, what was I dotted with N? Well, let's see. Go to our recipe here. I dotted with N turned out to be zero. Over I hat magnitude, which is one, times N vector magnitude, which is 42,000. Inverse cosine of zero. Nine day. I'm going to write dot, dot, dot. Maybe. Because this is the first time we do something called a quadrant check. We're going to have to do this thing called a quadrant check with the remaining three COEs. Now, your equation sheet, I want to point this out. It has it here for you. It has this test. It basically says, look. If you're a J hat component of the N vector was less than zero, so negative, basically check what we got for N vector. Basically, if this term is negative, you need to take 360 minus what we got. So let's do the test. So turns out the J term here is negative of N vector. Well, looks like that 90 is not the final answer. After a quadrant check, Quadrant check. We find out that RAN is actually 270. Don't forget your quadrant check test. Okay. Moving right along. Let's keep pressing. We're almost there, actually, believe it or not. Step five. Let's do... Argument of perigee, little omega. It's not the size of the omega. It's the size of the fight in the omega. That's what matters. The equation sheet tell us, tells us it's n vector dotted with e vector over our magnitudes. Kind of the same pattern as we've seen before. And, of course, it comes with its, own, its very own delicious little quadrant check. So we'll address that in a second. 
All right, from previous, we found that n vector, oh, let me look at my sheet, was slash is <laughs> 0 i hat minus 42,000 j hat plus 0 k hat. Eccentricity vector, well, that was several steps ago, but not to worry, we have that data as well. What did we get? We got that e vector was 0 i hat plus 0 0.368 j hat plus 0 k hat. Looking good. That's actually all we need. So let's first, let's dot these two. What's it like to dot these two? Well, looks like n dotted with e vectors is 0. Uh, it's no, no hats. It's a dot product produces a scalar. So 0 minus negative 42,000 times 0.368. So minus 15,456 j hat. Oh, gosh. Don't make the mistake that I did. It's a scalar. There's no components when you dot something. Plus zero. Okay, so that ends up being this negative 15, 4, 56. Great. Now, what's the magnitude of n? Well, we previously found that it was 42,000. The magnitude of e we found earlier was 0 0.368. So, what does that give us? Well, Omega equals the dot product, oops, sorry, cosine inverse of this n dotted with e, which is what? Negative 15,456 over 42,000 times 0.368, which is 15,456. So you get the inverse cosine of negative 1. And that gives us 180. Or does it? Maybe. Then a wild quadrant check appears. Okay, so what is our test? What is our test for argument of perigee? Well, it says, all right, go back to your eccentricity equation. If that k hat component is less than zero, note, not including zero. If it's less than zero, if it's negative at all, then you have to do your quadrant check. Or you have to do your, your 360 minus. Okay, well, let's go back to what was our eccentricity vector when we worked it out. It was, let's see, there's the i hat term, there's the j hat. Whoop, looks like there was zero for k hat. Which is great. Why is that great? Well, it means we don't have to do 180 or 360 minus because the k hat term for eccentricity vector was zero itself. Not less than zero, it was zero itself. So. No drama. Don't have to worry about it. Great. Oh, we're almost there, guys. We're, we are closing in. Okay. Next thing. Last thing. Step six. True anomaly. Same old pattern as before, right? Something dotted with something over two things times each other. Well, what was our eccentricity vector? You guys might remember since we just used it. Dotted with the R vector, which, whoo, going all the way back to the beginning, was 0 i hat, negative 14,000, j hat, 0. K hat, so let's let's dot those bad boys. Hmm. Oop. Oop. Let's see. 
to negative 152. I actually may have an error. I think I may have just induced an error. Partial credit for me, right? Let's see. Nope, nope, actually good. I'll take it back. I must believe in myself. I believe in myself. Now I do anyway. Okay. So, and of course, again, I keep adding freaking hats to dot product things that should not have hats. Learn from my boneheaded mistake making this movie at the end of the day. Um, don't put hatted components for dot products. You get just a scalar out of that, negative 51, 52. So that's E dot with R. Okay, magnitude of E vector. Not even going to work it out again. We found that was 0.368. Magnitude of R vector. Not going to work that out either because we found that it was 14,000. So new. What's new? Ha, ha, ha. Astro's favorite dad joke. What's new? That's new. Ha, ha, ha. Okay. E hat or E vector rather dotted with R vector. Over magnitude of both. So we found that to be negative 51, 52 over 0.368 times 14,000. And if I am not mistaken, that's another inverse cosine. Of negative one. We just confirm. Yep, confirmed. Confirmed. So that's going to give us 180. Maybe. Quadrant check. But of course, but of course. So our test says if R dotted with V was less than zero, so if it was negative. Not including zero, but if r dot of v was negative and less than zero, then we have to do a quadrant check. Well, what do we know? Without even doing any more math, we got r dot with v to be zero. No need for the quadrant check math. So, new is 180. Ta-da! We're done. So what we would do is kind of get our thoughts gathered here. Start filling in. A, 10 to 35, 0.5 kilometers. Eccentricity, we just used it, 0.368. Inclination, we got that to be 45 degrees. Ran, we got to be 270 degrees. And argument of perigee and true anomaly, we got both to be 180. So I say ta-da because this method, if you use it, practice it, get quick with it, will never fail you on the GR. And in this particular GR, it was worth more than 10% of the entire test. So it's worth your time to get good at it. Uh, recommend, definitely recommend getting good at it. Um, and again, I ended up with six spare sheets of paper, not because you need that much uh, on the GR, but because I was just trying to demo it for the webcam and, and bigger writing is, is better. So... Okay, now let's take a look at a quick, uh, I was going to say a quick trip, but a quick trip. I dare you say that 10 times fast. Okay, let's rewind and go back to step one. We were still trying to find some major axis. Let's say right off the bat. You take the dot product of R and V. Now we found this a little bit later in the long way, but okay. Remember what we said: R dot with V being zero can only happen at three places, right? Apogee, perigee, or a circular orbit. It's always true. So what I can do with that information is I'm going to do a comparison. Here's my a tip and trick area here. I can get A quickly. Um, I'm going to show you how. Rather, I can get E quickly. Sorry. You've got to solve all the way to get A. 
and then do your R.W. So I'm going to do a comparison between A, which is a property of the orbit, right? That's just how big the orbit is, and the magnitude of that position vector. So let me draw a very elliptical potato orbit. I think you guys would all buy that half the length, the long ways of the orbit is called the semi major axis. We represent that with A. Not a perfect drawing, but it is true. If your position vector, let's say that you were way the heck out here. This is your satellite. Would you guys buy my observation that R looks significantly longer than A? Okay, if so, then that will tell us some things. In our, that, that was just kind of a general example. In our actual GR problem here, we've got oof, an orbit, and we found the semi-major axis. This is a quick way of getting eccentricity. I probably should have said that at the beginning, but that's, that's the reason we're taking this shortcut. What I'm getting at is if your position vector is bigger, the magnitude of it is bigger than center major axis, you know you're out at perigee. So let me write it like this. If your current magnitude of R is bigger than A and R dot with V was zero, then spacecraft is at perigee, oh, daggum, apogee. And you can use this very little easy equation, r sub a equals a times 1 plus e. So is that the case in our case? Well, let's check it out. Our semi major axis is 10,235. And what did we get the magnitude of the position vector to be 14,000? Well, turns out that because our vector is 14,000, that's much, much bigger, well, significantly bigger than semi major axis of A. Looks like we are at apogee. So we can use that to solve for eccentricity way faster. And watch this, it's actually gonna be the same answer as before. Oh boy. And I, I encourage you to work it yourself as with all of this stuff, but let me plug and chug here. And sure enough, we get 0 0.368 for our eccentricity, just as we did before. Okay, uh, I won't work it all the way through, but let's say, well, I will work it all the way through. What if we draw our orbit here? What if my position vector placed the spacecraft right here? Now that is much smaller, that position vector, than the center major axis of the orbit. Again, that r dot v being zero is a condition that still has to be true. So if the magnitude of the position vector is smaller than the semi major axis, and then r dot v is zero, the spacecraft is at perigee, and you can use r sub p is a times one minus e to solve for eccentricity. 
So you might ask, well, why would I do that if the long way always works? Well, let's say you're running out of time and you left this for last on the GR. You could very quickly do your R magnitude, V magnitude, almost by looking at it, some of them, real quick solve out. I say real quick, but pretty quickly solve out for your some major axis. Use the quick trick to get eccentricity. And also, the quick trick gives you true anomaly, believe it or not. What is true anomaly at Apogee? It's 180 degrees away from perigee. Oh, what is new at perigee? True anomaly. Zero. So again, if I use these tests and I find out that my spacecraft is at perigee or apogee, that quickly gives me true anomaly. So I could get, let's see, 2%, 2%, 4%. So I get 8% out of a 12% problem lickety split and if I didn't have time for inclination ran and little omega uh, the argument of perigee at least I would have eight percent out of the twelve the risk that we see often is that students leave this for last and then just get bogged down right in step one here don't get bogged down in step one if you do nothing else for this test do this page to this page so okay well I hope that gives you a good overview um, work these problems through there are many on the K drive and come see us. We would love to, to walk you through them. So, all right.